People first organizations will win in the future of work. Your only real asset is your people. We, we all, all want, want purpose to work. work. HR led organization is. I'm the sorry, but leaders don't lead empty desks and empty shop floors. Welcome to the People Strategy Leaders Show. I'm your host, Sri Chalapa, founder and president of Engagedly, and a serial entrepreneur in technology, films, and music. This is where we talk to people leaders, business strategists, and organizational savants about leading in the time of change. What is working, what is not working, and more importantly, what we should be thinking about. Stick around to the end of the show. We will reveal how you can be our next guest. And now, let's engage. Hello, this is Sri Chalapa with People Strategy Leaders Podcast, and welcome back. Today, I am joined with Brian Gillette. I'm so excited to talk to you, Brian. Uh, You're an endurance athlete, and we'll get more into that uh, in more detail. Uh, So Brian is a former Silicon Valley human resource executive, founder of his own leadership consulting business, and amateur ultra endurance athlete. He has ridden his bike across the United States and run 205 miles around Lake Tahoe. Brian knows how to connect with both business leaders and amateur athletes to help them reach their peak and achieve the impossible. So after interviewing about 100 leaders on how they reach their peak and his own experience in both roles, he wrote Epic Performance, Lessons from 100 Executives and Endurance Athletes on Reaching Your Peak. Welcome to the show, Brian. It is such an honor to have you. Shrikant, it is a pleasure to be on your show. It's nice to talk to you. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, I, I... struggle with doing a good time on my 5k race that I'm planning for next month. Um, so tell me a little bit about this endurance. I'm really intrigued about, you know, how you, uh, what exactly this endurance run was, uh, and then how you prepared for it. And maybe we, there are lessons, obviously you learned from that, that, you know, you, you think apply to the business world as well. Yeah, more than happy. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of similarities to what you do on an ultra di- distance event, to uh, what you do to be really, you know, kind of reach certain peaks at work as well. And that's why I interviewed, kind of those 100 people, it was a mixture of mostly executives, but then a uh, about 25% on the ultra distance athletes. And and there's a lot of similarities between between those two. So a 205 mile run, um, how you prepare for it, it's kind of like how you prepare for anything big is you spend a lot of time, you have to make sacrifices, you have a vision of kind of what's in the future and what you want the finish line to look for. Um, if for me, you, it, it, it's an organized run. There are about 70 people that started it. Um, it took me 76 and a half hours, and I was kind of at, on the faster side. I was uh, number 11th that came across. Um, and and the, the amount of uh, training is, is tremendous. I mean, there were some weeks where I was training for 30 hours. I was exercising 30 hours a week. Um, and I had come into the training fairly uh, in fairly good shape, having completed a hundred mile or about you know nine ten months earlier. So great great experience, um, and look forward to chatting more about it. Yeah. So a two hundred five mile run, obviously, when you run that long, you have to take breaks. Um, so tell me about how that run actually. Um, how did how did that entire pl- uh, process That's take the- place? Yeah, how's it work? So in terms of breaks, you roughly every 15 to 20 miles, there is an aid station. And at the aid station, you can get you can get water, you can get food, you know, you can get you know new pair of shoes if you've got your crew there. And I had a crew of seven people. And, and, and what's interesting is a lot of people think that something like this is a very much an individual sport. Um, and I could not have done it. I could have, I, I, I couldn't have done it as, as easily, um, without the, the crew that I had behind me. Um, at some point at, at about mile 67, um, you can get a, what's called a pacer and it's somebody that can run with you. So I had, I had a number of pacers and they would run anywhere from 20 to 25 miles with me. Um, because you're running through the night, you start at nine in the morning. And then you just, you got a hundred hours in order to finish and you, you run through the night. Um, if you want to sleep, you can sleep wherever you want. Um, there were, and, and it's all on remote trails out around Lake Tahoe. I mean, Lake, Lake Tahoe is kind of this beautiful lake at 6,000 feet and it's surrounded by some 10,000 foot peaks. And so some point, some point you're getting close to 10,000 feet and some point you're down to around lake level. Um, so you've, you've got these aid stations you can go into. Um, there would be times I'd be running along out in the remote wilderness and there would be somebody, you know, taking a nap, you know, maybe in the middle of the night, 
Um, I tried to sleep um, earlier about 30 miles, about 30 hours in, about 100 miles in, and I had taken some caffeine pills earlier and I just couldn't sleep. And so I continued on. So the first time I really slept was for about um, 60 hours in. Um, I got 90 minutes of sleep, which was, oh, that was, it was wonderful. <laughs> and then continued on to finish another marathon. That's awesome. So the lessons from that race and other endurance athletes that you've talked to, you say apply to business leaders, especially, I guess, startup leaders as well. So tell me a little bit about that. Um, and what are the similarities in that race versus, uh, you know, running a, an organization? Yeah. So, I mean, what got me to write the book and, and what EPIC stands for is, you know, I had had a lot, a number of people that would say to me, oh, I couldn't do that, or I could never run a marathon. Um, my, my wife and I took our two kids out of school for a year and traveled around the world. And before we went, a number of people said, oh, I could never do that. And it kind of kind of pulled at me and I thought, no, you, you probably can. And so I looked at some of the things that I do in order to run the marathon, kind of the, the eight, eight marathons or run any endurance event, and then thought I, I can also learn from all these executives. And, and some of the, and so what Epic stands for, and, and these are the five kind of elements that, that get you to the peak or get you to, to the finish line is the E is how do you envision the big things? You know, whether it is at work or whether it is on sport or whether it is in life, how do you envision the big things that you need or want to accomplish? And then, you know, the, the people that can see that future, the P is plan. How do you put a plan in place in order to uh, go accomplish that? And the I is iterate. How do you work your way up? And, and this is, you know, you don't start off running 205 miles. You start off running a 5K and then a 10K and you kind of iterate your way up. You don't, you know, you've, you're, uh, you've been involved in a number of startups. You don't start at $100 million. <laughs> you, know, you start with your first sale and then you, you build up and you kind of get bigger and then you make the product bigger and you expand on it. You iterate to it. The C is how do you collaborate with others? How do you learn from people that have gone before you? I mean, listening to this podcast is one way because people can learn about, you know, entrepreneurship or people's strategy. Um, so I love that you're doing that. So who are your mentors? And then lastly, how do you perform? So that's epic performance and performance is how do you get to the finish line? And I just, as I talk to executives and I talk to ultra distance athletes, I just, I could see how people that would accomplish amazing things in sport or in business, they were doing roughly the same things. They could see the future and they were very deliberate on how they got there. And they also knew that they had to take, they had to make uh, sacrifices at times. I mean, you, you've, uh, you've been involved in startups and you know that startups, you spend a lot of time early on and a lot of hours and you're probably away from your family. Um, you're not at home, uh, maybe every dinner for every dinner. And so, cause you have to make sacrifices and it's the same thing with anything big, you got to make sacrifices. So I just saw the parallels between the two and that's why I wanted to kind of put it down on, uh, on paper. Yeah. So you, after in interviewing a hundred of them, which is a, a monumental achievement by itself, um, <laughs> You know, uh, I don't, I, I guess you just don't, don't like to think small. So that's uh, excellent. You know, people can take um, a cue from that. What are some of the common things or traits that you observed that we can take away from these endurance business leaders and endurance athletes? Well, I, mean, I think you hit on one of the big ones. They don't think small. Yeah. <laughs> they, they think big um, and, and they're able to figure out they've got that confidence that, okay, I can go try it. I mean, I think some of the, the key ones that I heard is they're very focused and they're very focused on the future as well. So, and when I talk about future, I'm not talking about next year. I'm talking about 10 years, 15 years out. You know, one of the executives I talked to, founder of a number of companies, and he could think of an idea and that idea maybe today there wasn't the computer processing power or wasn't the, the technology that could do it today. But what he would look at is what is the pace of computer technology, kind of Moore's law as we're, you know, you're, you're probably mm -hmm. familiar with. 
And, you know, how quick is memory work? How quick is battery going? How, you know, how much power is needed? So he can look at the speed of that and know that, all right, the technology that I'm thinking about today isn't, can't be supported by our current infrastructure. But based on where that infrastructure is going, I expect it could be supported in 10 years. So that's what these people are doing. They're really focused on the future. And, and what they're doing as well is, you know, I, I, I hear people say, oh, you know, I let fate drive where I'm going to go. And these people don't. You know, they mm -hmm. look and say, hey, I want to go that direction. And they go in that direction. Um, they don't just kind of get up in the morning and kind of go wherever it takes them. Um, and, and lastly is, you know, they were, I mean, there's a bunch of other things, but another one I'll just share about is their confidence, confidence in their ability to do something. And, and there's that fine line between confident and, and ego. And, and I, I didn't find these people had a big ego. I thought they were more humble than I expected. Um, but they had the confidence and that confidence came from doing smaller things and being successful, what I call iterate. So they would iterate, get success, iterate bigger, get success and kind of iterate again. But and, and they also they had some failures and they knew that when they would get to a failure, they'd hit a wall. They would go around the wall or try to figure out a way around the wall in order to keep moving. Yeah. And any startup or any big venture, you know, you can think like a startup, even in a bigger company, obviously. Um, do you, at, you, at some point you hit a, a wall, the yeah. momentum gets stalled. You know, and maybe, and you're just tired. Maybe you've been at it for three, four, five years, and you're just a little tired. Like you said, in your run, you know, at some point, you just got to take a break. I mean, is there any parallels to that in terms of what they do to keep the momentum going so that they don't deflate their team um, and, and, and still stay true to the mission? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of things that people do. And, you know, and, and it, it applies, especially when you're running 200 miles as you get tired. <laughs> and, you know, even writing writing the book, there were times, you know, it's it's a long time to get a book out. And there were times it's like, oh, I'm just tired. You know, what's going to keep me going? And, and one of the things I heard over and over is really focusing on that why. You know, why are you doing this? What the, it is an emotional journey to do anything big. And there are ups and downs and kind of thinking about what is that emotional feeling, that excitement you're going to have when you get to the end. And so, you know, what, what is it that, that you're trying to accomplish? You know, a couple people I spoke to, one guy who he runs a, a large organization for the cap in, you know, in the capital city of uh, Sac in California for in the Sacramento area. And, and so it, it's all around uh, business development or economic development, I should say. And I said, why do you do it? You know, because he's just pushing and driving, driving and driving. And he goes, when, when I was a kid, I saw my dad lose his job and I never wanted other people to experience that feeling because when he lost his job, he lost kind of a, a part of himself Right, and he never regained that back. And so the reason I work so hard around business development is because I don't want other people to see that. And so when he's feeling kind of uh, exhausted, he thinks back to that. You know, another woman I spoke to who runs an organization called All Across Africa, she's got about 4,000 weavers. These are people that make these beautiful gold baskets, and they're exported into the U.S. and, and into uh, Europe. And she's been through two pandemics, Ebola and COVID. And I, and I asked her, how do you do it? And she goes, you know, when I came out of college, I went to Africa and spent some time in Sierra Leone. And as I got to learn more about Africa, there's a billion people on that planet, 80% of them in are poverty. And I wanted to make a difference and f predominantly around the women in Africa. And so when it gets hard, I think about that. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. you know, it, it, and on the opposite side of that, Sheree, is you got to be able to, you know, at some point it's so big you, that that's hard to kind of move forward. Sometimes you got to think so small. It's like, what do I need today? in order to get to tomorrow. Right. So there, there's those, sometimes you think big, th sometimes you think think small. Yeah, and I think it's, it's also important to be kind to yourself sometimes, right? Now, at some point I realize I've just had a tough week. I worked through the weekend and then Monday, I feel like I just don't have it in me today. That doesn't mean I'm giving up. Yeah. I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna call it 
a time out for myself, for my own mental well-being and say, I just want to get through the day today, not try to do anything big, not try to kill myself or beat myself over because something I didn't, you know, want, something I didn't do and just get through the day, get some rest and we'll start again tomorrow. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and I'll tell you, you know, kind of two short stories. When I was training for the Tahoe run, you know, there were seven months where I knew I was going to have to be doing a lot of running or, do, you know, getting up early in the morning. And I told myself, I said, I'm going to give myself three kind of get out of exercise cards that if I wake up and I just don't want to do it, I can take that card and I can guilt free not exercise, but I only have three of them and I can only use them over the next seven months. So it, it, it gave me a little bit of freedom to, in a sense, kind of take it easy. Um, and, and I never used them, but I always knew that if I got up, you know, and sometimes you're getting up at three in the morning and it's raining out and you, you know, you got to run. And, and, you know, another executive, a founder of a couple companies, phenomenally successful CEO, he's a, he's a great golfer as well. And he goes, when I go out and golf, I give myself two bogeys that I know that I, on this, this round or on the, yeah, this round, I can get two bogeys and everything's going to be fine. And if they happen to be the first two, then I know that's like, okay, those I've used up my two, I don't have any more left. And so it's a little bit of a mental game that it's like giving yourself permission to kind of fail for a period of time. Right. Right. And, and that's, it's important to say, if, even if you miss a day, that doesn't mean you give up. It means you missed right. that day. Next right. day is, an, is a new start. You can, you can do it again. Some people, you know, especially in dieting, right? They, they, they just can't stop themselves from eating a pizza or ice cream. Yeah. And then what happens is they do that and then they feel like a failure. And then they're like, you know what, I'm just going to give up and they give up. And that's where that's where the big mistake is, right? You say I did that, you know, war on me, but it's over now. Let's get back on the plan, you know. And I think that's important uh, it's, for a lot of leaders. And, yeah, it's so important. It, but it's giving yourself that permission. If you're going to go on that diet, tell yourself don't don't. If if you love ice cream, don't say I'm going to completely get rid of ice cream. Say I'm just going to cut down to two bowls a week. Right. And make it so it's realistic and then maybe or, or, or four bowls a week. And then maybe when you get down to four bowls, you can kind of go, OK, I'm going to take it down to three. But give yourself that permission to not be perfect. Yeah. 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 Great. Now, there are certain things that you said uh, earlier uh, that some of the things that surprised you about these high performance goal oriented uh, individuals. What were some of the things that surprised you? You know, one of them, I mean, is, is how I thought they were very humble um, in, you know, we just had to have a nice one-on-one -on -one conversation similar to how you and I are having it. And I had a bunch of questions and, and, and when I reached out to them, you know, so many of them said, well, why you, why you want to talk to me? And, and I would say, well, you know, you've, you've started up this company, you run this company, you've done this. And they said, oh, okay. And, and then the other thing that surprised me is, and, and it was a lesson that I knew, but I kind of reinforced is I wondered how many people am I going to have to ask in order to get a hundred interviews? And I only had two people that said no. And one of them was a very legitimate, there were family issues going on. So I, it's like, it, it reinforced to me that if you don't ask, the answer is going to be no. But if you do ask, the answer just might be yes. And right. so your chances of getting a yes are much better if you ask than if you don't ask. So that humbleness and that willing to help. I mean, I, I think so many people are, you know, I, I was nervous about asking people because I'm going to be taking up their time. But they, I think in many cases, were just were appreciative that I asked. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So. I mean, it's, it seems so commendable, you know, just wrapping my head around your run and then all the people who have been successful in, you know, running or, or training uh, and running startups, you know, Elon Musk doing four startups and all of them being successful, at least in some level or the other. Right. It's mind boggling, right? Um, and these are what I would call epic achievers to take your term, right? Yeah. Why, 
what holds people, other people back? I mean, these are not even 1%. You're talking about 0.1% at best. Maybe, I don't even know, I haven't done any math on this, but yeah. you might know what people would you consider epic performers. But I would say it's less than one in thousand, if at, if that. Um, what about the rest of, of, the, of the humans out there that holds them back? Yeah, you know, I, 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 you know in terms of, of what holds people back, there's a lot of fear um, that holds us back. You know, fear of failure. Um, and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm afraid to, to fail. And, and often we think about, you know, failure, it, it's, it's that worst case scenario. It's like, you know, oh, I'm going to get fired from my job. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose all my money. I'm going to die. We think of that worst case scenario and, and rarely does that worst case scenario happen. And I, and I was, I was talking to one, uh, one founder and who, who's actually a phenomenal skier. And he says, you know, when I'm skiing and I, I'm standing on top of a cornice and I'm looking down, he goes, there's that component where we can think about what the worst case scenario is, where it's death. Mm -hmm. But so many things have to happen for that worst case scenario to occur. A number, it can't, it's generally not one thing. It's a couple of things. And so he goes, I like to think more about what's the realistic worst case scenario is my kind of my bar. Um, but we're a fear, afraid of something happening. Mm -hmm. And, and so we have to really get down to what that fear is. I think fear is good in some sense, is it, it, it keeps our species alive. <laughs> you know, when, when early man would go out into the, into the, you know, the jungle and would see a deadly animal, early man would leave. Would, so it, it, you run away and you protect yourself from that fear. But what it also does is it prevents us from moving forward when fear is relatively low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think the other thing, Shri, is we just don't look out far enough. You know, we look out one, two, three years, but these folks are looking out 20, 30 years. And because you get an idea, you know, let, let's say it's they've never somebody's never run a marathon before and only one percent of the population's done that. U.S. population, which um, surprised me when I saw that number. Is I'm think, surprised oh, it is that high, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I was surprised it was that low, but it, I, you know, we all have different perspectives. And, and so, but it's, um, you know, you, people may think, oh, I couldn't run a marathon. And, and, and what we have to, the, the folks I talk to, it's, I can't run a marathon today. Right. I can't run a marathon yet, but I have the confidence in order to kind of train in order to get to that. And, and I remember when I, I, I was finishing a 300 mile bike ride and as I was coming to the finish line, I was thinking about what's my next goal. And I said, it is a marathon. And shortly thereafter, I went out and ran four, four miles and my legs were just like, were, were exhausted and I was sore. And I thought, okay, I'm not able to, I'm not ready to run a marathon today, but I know what it takes to get there. And I will in a couple of, you know, in two months or three months. Yeah. Um, so, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the people impact it has on these leaders, because that's what our podcast is about, the people strategy. So how do these uh, individuals motivate and drive high performance in their people? Because a leader without their people is not going to go very far. Right. Um, so how, how, what is their selection process? What is their process to retain and motivate and drive high performance from these generally, I would say, normal, ordinary people, but they're performing extraordinarily big things as a team. Yeah. I, I mean, a couple things come to my mind or come to mind, um, Shri, is one is the really good ones have a good vision. And it's a compelling vision that is good for the company and it's good for, you know, the individual. It's exciting. You know, it gets, you, you, you look at a lot of technology, um, a lot of engineers, because I work in the Silicon Valley, and, you know, engineers love, a lot of engineers love to work on really cool technology. And so, you know, these, these leaders know how to put a compelling vision that is exciting. It gives meaning. One of the companies I worked for, it was a technology company. We, we uh, created software that helped improve or speed up the FDA approval process on a drug or on any uh, kind of pharmaceuticals. And, and the founder of the company, who's one of the guys I interviewed, he, he didn't talk about that speed. What he talked about how, you know, when I started this company, I wanted to cure cancer. And we think about curing cancer, you got to be a doctor, you know, in the medicine. And he wasn't that. 
But what he was doing is he was playing a part to speed up the approval process of drugs. He was creating a software. And so he played a small part in the, uh, in the help uh, curing cancer. And mm -hmm. so it changed the vision as opposed to, hey, we're just doing code for a software company. You make some money, right? It's more yeah. than money. We're trying to make a difference. And so how, you know, the good ones know how to, how to really envision things and then share that vision. And then the other mm -hmm. one is they know how to stretch people. Um, I was listening to an interview with Albert Borla, who is the C CEO of Pfizer. And he was talking about being asked about how were you able to get a drug to market so quickly? And he talked about how, you know, I really had to kind of stretch people beyond where they, they thought they could go. And how do we push people a little bit further? I call it that, that nervous quotient. You know, how are, we, how are we taking on things that make us nervous, that make our heart beat a little bit quicker? And then when we're doing that, we're probably stretching ourselves. And so good leaders know how to stretch themselves and they act as a role model but they also know how to stretch those around them and kind of push them further than maybe they would, the individual would have gone them um, themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's a popular quote, right? If you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. That's right. And, and, and somebody told me the other day, like, I don't think I can. And I said, you're right. Right. <laughs> because <laughs> if you think you can't, you can't, you know, and that's exactly what it is. You know, you gotta be able to think big and you, maybe you can't, maybe you can't, but I think thought, uh, and like even with the you know physical activities like the ones you're doing, I don't know if I would ever subject myself to that much torture. But it's still it's it a lot of it is possible. Maybe you know you can run a 205 mile race, but you could potentially run a marathon. Um, you know. Right. And I'm and and my whole view, and this is kind of what really got me going into the book. I'm I don't I don't necessarily want everybody to go out and or think they can go out and run 200 miles. But what I want them, if they think they're they can reach this, how do they kind of push themselves a little bit higher? Mm -hmm. So that person that was running the 5K, how do they push them and that thinks they can't do a 10K? Go out and try it. You know, right. what's the worst that's going to happen? Chances are you're not, you're going to get to 8K. That's probably the worst situation. And you're going to be sore for a couple of days. Right, right. Um, so it goes back to that fear um, uh, of, of not doing something. Well, Brian, it's been a pleasure having you on this call. It's it's not every day that I have an endurance athlete and somebody who connects that to business on on the call. So thanks for making the connection. I really appreciate it. So, Brian, um, just to close out this uh, discussion, how can people reach you and what type of work do you do that could potentially help them? Yeah, no, th thank you for having me on your show. It's been a pleasure talking to you and, and I've enjoyed uh, listening to some of your other podcasts. So to reach me, you know, a couple ways. I'm on LinkedIn, so Brian Gillette. Um, you can also go to my website, which is epicperformances.com. So it's E-P-I-C performances with an S dot com. Um, the book, Epic Performances, Lessons from 100 Leaders and Executive, or Lessons from 100 Executives and Endurance Athletes on Reaching Your Peak is available on Amazon. Um, and, and kind of the two things that I focus on with my clients, I do do a fair amount of executive coaching kind of one on one, but also do a lot of strategic planning with companies as they're trying to think about where do we take our company, where do we take our, our organization over the next couple of years, and then how do we how do we put those together and then how do we get the team and coalesced aligned in order to make sure you're going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian. It's been a Honor to have you. It's not every day I get to talk to epic performer yourself. Uh, with that, we'll close out the show. Again, this is Sri Chalapa with People Strategy Leaders. Thank you for listening. Sri Chalapa here. Thank you so much for listening to the People Strategy Leaders podcast. If you are a successful leader or a people strategist who would like to be on this program, please visit engagedly.com slash people strategy leaders podcast. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag People Strategy Leaders. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content. To make sure you don't miss any episodes, go ahead and subscribe. Your thumbs up, ratings, and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter at Sri Chalapa. 
Thanks for listening. We will see you next time. And thank you to Patrick Ramsey, sound engineer at Kalinga Production Studios for recording and mixing this show.